you've seen this video, or at least you have now. This is footage of a robotic assisted surgery. Granted, this is being done on a grape, but I hope that this is as cool to you as it is to me. I don't know exactly when I saw this video, but as soon as I learned about this technology, I was positively enamored. I really wanted to operate a machine like this. Barring eight to 12 years of medical school and surgical residency, the only other way I think I'd be able to operate one of these machines would be to buy one outright. Let's see how much one of these bad boys costs. Two million dollars. And that's not all. Annual maintenance is something to the tune of $175,000, and there are additional expenses incurred every time the robot is used. These are for consumables, things like covers, PPE for the robot, and its favorite snacks. Consumables. So I eventually accepted that the only way I'd get to see one of these medical marvels in person would likely be under anesthesia, if you catch my drift. But times have changed. I recently learned a bit more about the Da Vinci suite of surgical tools and solutions offered by Intuitive Surgical. You see, the robot stays put. That's a heavy boy. It's not going anywhere. In addition to the robot, Intuitive Surgical sells instruments, which are basically the accessories that attach to the robot and allow the robot to perform any number of incredibly complex surgeries. These instruments are, of course, sterilized between uses. And some of these instruments, especially the more mechanically complex ones, are going to experience some accelerated wear and tear due to the sterilization cycle. Perhaps because of this, Intuitive gives each surgical instrument a lifespan, a number of uses that the instrument is good for before it needs to be replaced. Some may say this 10 to 15 punch limit is a safety feature to make sure that a mechanical failure never occurs in the middle of surgery. Some may also say that limiting the instruments to 10 uses is just an example of planned obsolescence, forcing these hospitals to pony up and pay for more instruments to use the surgical equipment that they already purchased. Whether it's about safety or money, the outcome is all the same. Every year, thousands of these surgical instruments, mostly in perfectly good working order, need to be disposed of. Some hospitals throw these used instruments into their trash chute, but some hospitals sell them on eBay to me. To get started, I purchased one instrument from a used medical device vendor on eBay. This was for me to figure out if reanimating one of these things would even be possible. This is the large suture cut needle driver and served as my sort of entryway into this world. This is the perfect surgical instrument to start out with because it features Intuitive Surgical's endo wrist technology, which is basically their patented mechanism or maybe series of mechanisms that explain exactly how they are able to create wristed motion in such a small space. This carbon fiber shaft is only eight millimeters wide. It's very lightweight and the entire system is cable driven. Now I have yet to take one of these apart myself, but if this is something you'd be interested in seeing, please drop a like or a comment. After I received my first instrument, it was time for me to figure out if reanimating one of these things would even be possible. Now in a world of proprietary connections and uh, decreasing rights to repair, I was fully expecting this thing to be pretty much inoperable without the rest of the machine. But thankfully, because of the almost entirely mechanical nature of this instrument, which again, in part is necessary because these things are sterilized, there's nothing to really stop someone like you or I from acquiring one of these instruments, new or used, and using it for our own purposes. So I set up some eBay alerts to figure out if I could purchase maybe a lot of these instruments. They're not particularly expensive, but you could probably buy about 10 gallons of almond milk with the money I'd spend on one of these. So I definitely wanted to try to get bulk pricing if possible. And I ended up just barely winning an auction for two single site sets. The goal of these sets is to include everything a surgical team might need in the operating room to perform a robotic assisted single site surgery. This includes a number of different instruments as well as all kinds of different trocars and mounting apparatuses. These single site sets included two different types of instruments. These green ones, which have sort of a floppy thinner shaft and only have two degrees of freedom. And these blue ones, as you see here. These have a rigid eight millimeter carbon fiber shaft in part to accommodate the increased mechanical complexity inside. We'll save the green ones for later.
Okay, great. I've got all the instruments I could ever need. So the plan then is to figure out exactly how this thing works, make a model of any necessary mechanical relationships, and based on that, I should be able to make the electronics. From there, it's as simple as building the rest of the robot and making everything talk together. And before you know it, we should be taking care of some produce patients. We know that there are four inputs to the instrument here, four corresponding discs to control those inputs, and four motors to spin the four discs. Now, the DaVinci SI robot that these instruments are compatible with has four robotic arms. Three of them you'll put an instrument on, and one of them is for the endoscope. Because these instruments are sterilized between each use, it makes sense to have the electronics, the uh, motors, and basically anything of value inside the robot arm itself. So I threw together a super rough prototype, which has four motors and some discs to allow this thing to couple with the instrument, typed up some code, and immediately broke my prototype. What happened, you ask? I had the same question. It turns out the cable-driven nature of these instruments results in what you might call coupled motion. Even though there are four different inputs, none of these inputs operates truly independently of the others. With the exception of the rotation of the device, every other disc is in some way coupled with the other discs. It's critical then to understand how each disc's movement relates to the other movements and how the limits of each disc change as a function of the other disc's movements. Otherwise, if I try to flex the instrument around its abduction axis, uh, I might accidentally clamp down on something I don't mean to clamp on. So I did some good old trial and error to figure out these relationships in order to then translate these relationships into code. This started by labeling each of the disks to help keep track of things. There is some sort of neutral point for both the disk and the pulley that it controls inside of the actual instrument. So for the rest of the testing, I placed everything at that 12 o'clock position to try to isolate variables. From there, it was as simple as identifying the different axes of movements and then manipulating the end effector to see what affected what. And I summarized my findings here. Basically, if you wish to have a 90 degree abduction in either direction, you would need to see these rotations of the disks, assuming that you don't want anything else to move. You can see that this is also true for whatever kind of jaw the instrument is equipped with, whether it be scissors or clamping, anything like that. For the jaws to go from the closed state to the open state, it's as simple as ensuring that the delta between disk B and C increases by 30 degrees clockwise. This could be achieved by increasing the rotation of disk B by 30 degrees, by decreasing the rotation of disk C by 30 degrees, or as you're probably thinking, yes, anything in between, plus 15B minus 15C will get you the same outcome as well. Now with this understood, I can make a semi-reliable, semi-functioning prototype that will allow me to figure out the rest of my design. I also learned that I needed to upgrade these small nine gram servo motors to something a bit bigger and more up to the challenge. These larger servos have more torque and also feature metal gears on the inside, which should hopefully decrease the amount of damage that I incur. Now, while I thought these servos would be perfect, I immediately encountered another issue. Although they can fit side by side, these servos are literally 1.5 millimeters too long to be stacked end to end. My options were either to make some kind of gearbox or basically stadium seating instead. That way everybody can be coupled directly with their axis, uh, which is great because fewer parts for me to mess up and fewer things to go wrong. I emphasize the motors because I watched a number of different DaVinci training videos, some authorized and some not. <laughs> and I could never quite get an understanding of how exactly these instruments attach to the machine. You see, all of the reference videos I collected show the instrument sliding into place, but the discs, which are how the instrument actually connects to the motor, all have these locating pins here. I'm not sure exactly how this instrument can be attached in one direction when the motors need to connect in another, so I had to figure out my own solution. This is far from final, but for the sake of a functioning prototype, I made a spring-loaded four-bar mechanism. This allows the motor pack, as I'm calling it, to drop down and disengage from the docked instrument, after which the instrument can slide out and be replaced with a different one. Thankfully, designing this mechanism was a walk in the park. That's a lie. I had to learn a new CAD program for this. And once I 3D printed it, I learned that my design was perfect, and it worked on the first try. These failed prototypes would beg to differ. This leads me to one of my favorite features of this design, which is this springy thing. This is a 3D printed orthoplanar spring. Ortho, meaning the direction of deflection and rotation are at right angles to one another, and spring, meaning it goes like this. Now I can't take credit for this super cool spring. 
The design is by the amazing folks at the BYU Compliant Mechanisms Research Group, and I will link to both their file and website below. This is helpful for my application because it allows these connecting disc plate things to comply and flex up and down while the motors find their mark in a homing sequence, but they still effectively transfer rotation between the motor and the instrument. Now the end goal is obviously to have this on a robotic arm, but I need to focus on one thing at a time. So I repurposed this old monitor arm from Facebook Marketplace. This monitor arm is just like any one you'd find on Amazon and features the standard VESA mounting plate. I just ripped that off so I could bolt directly onto the arm and it ended up working pretty well for my application, except for the fact that these gas springs that allow the monitor arm to move up and down have a maximum load, but also a minimum load. And in my efforts to keep things relatively lightweight, my motor pack assembly isn't heavy enough to make things work. So I employed an additional weight to uh, help things move more smoothly in the meantime. This is perfect since it allows me to position the instrument wherever it needs to be in order for me to be able to test things. As far as next steps go, perhaps even more important than the robotic arm is figuring out what input solution I'm gonna go with. To control my prototype, I used a joystick and a simple potentiometer, but any good surgical robot is gonna have at least two of these instruments. Not to mention the litany of motors and axes to be accounted for when it comes to actually moving these instruments around. So I'm gonna to need to figure out some kind of intuitive control system, pun intended, to control upwards of 12 different motors. Here's some footage of surgery being performed with the DaVinci SI, and I need to figure out how to accomplish this without trying to reverse engineer one of these things. All I know for now is it probably shouldn't be voice controlled, but I haven't figured out much beyond that. If anybody has any ideas, please let me know in the comments. Now, I don't think this is quite ready for a grape appendectomy, but I think it's a good first step. If you would like to support me in this ridiculous pursuit, you can do so by hitting the subscribe button and you can hit the bell as well if you would like to be notified when the next video drops.